Holy Spirit who keeps and covers us. And by the power of your holy name, we pray for your name's sake. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay, the first two outcomes, and if you don't know the title of this study, is the, the ten outcomes that matter to God. And I want to remind you of two things. One, there are some things that matter to God. That's, that's the most important thing. There are some things that matter to God. And if they matter to God, here's the second thing. If they matter to God, they ought to matter to us. And if they don't matter to us, then what are you saying about your relationship to the Father? I used the illustration yesterday, and I used Jermichael yesterday, but I won't use Jermichael today. I use somebody else. <laughs> Who, who can I use? <laughs> I don't know. Let's see. Can I use you, bro? <clears throat> Elder Wilson? Yeah. <laughs> well, Jesus can use you, too. Thank God for that. Hallelujah. He's got a job. He works somewhere. I don't know where he does. He works for a hospital or something. Okay. Unless he has a supervisor, he's probably the big boss or whatever anyway. Unless he does have a supervisor. And the supervisor comes to him and says, hey, I, I need this report done. I got you got seven days to get it done in because it's really important. And I need to turn it into my superior. So I need you to work on your portion so that I can get my portion done, so I can get my portion to my superior. Seven days passes. <clears throat> he comes to Elder Wilkerson and says, hey, man, I, got, I need that data so I can put it in my report so I can give it to my superior, supervisor. Uh, and, and he says, well, I didn't do it. And his supervisor going to say, well, why? And he says, well, it, it, it just didn't matter to me. Mm -hmm. So now the supervisor went to him and said, well, it really did matter to me. Because it mattered to my security. Yeah. So if it didn't matter to you, then we're going to have, well, they, they, my wife says when they fire people at the hospital she works for, they call it releasing them to the community. <laughs> <laughs> So you need to prepare for a release to the community. If, if, if what matters to the person who is your leader does not matter to you, then you might be in line for a release to the community. That's right. You see, and, and so at the end of the day, I'm not saying God's going to fire you. He, he ain't going to fire you. That makes sense? Nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. You're safe. Your salvation is secure. He gave you the Holy Spirit to demonstrate that you are secure in Him. <clears throat> but I can tell you what you will experience if you do not do the things that matter to God. You will experience impotency. Wow. You will have no power. Wow. And you will be a baby Christian. Always falling out in the floor. And have to have your legs tanned up. Y'all know what tanned is? If I was in my own church, I'd say I'd beat your ass. <laughs> but since I ain't in my own church, I'd say that. <laughs> and I didn't say it, I mentioned it. You know the difference? I mentioned it and say it. it. used to be an English teacher. You know, there's mention, you can mention a word, but that doesn't mean you say it. <laughs> I can see him now. Well, oh, Daddy, I'm not saying it. I'm mentioning it. <laughs> uh, I'm going to take this whooping as a mention. <laughs> so the, the first two outcomes we talked about was that, that God has a, a desire that your knowledge of him will increase. 
Now we talked about this, and I'm going to do this real quickly because we, we, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I want those who weren't here, I want to refresh it in your mind because we know that in order for you to retain information, you need to hear it at least seven times. That's why the same commercial repeats at least three times during an hour. Yeah. You see, so knowledge is not just information accumulation. It's not just the accumulation of information and data. Knowledge is the intimate entangling of your heart and mind. Your heart is your mind, quite frankly, with the information. So the information becomes part of who you are. So, so I, my example to you is real simply this, is each person in here, at one point in your life, along your pilgrimage, didn't know how to walk. Somebody took the time to teach you how to walk. And they did it so well that what you did not know, you learned. And once you learned it and practiced it, now, those steps are important. You were ignorant, which means the absence of information and knowledge. Someone began to teach you. You didn't know what you were learning. What you learned, you then practiced. And what you practiced, you perfected. You see, so that's part of our challenge as believers is we we don't know things, and then when someone teaches it to us, we're like, oh, that's cool, that's, that's good food for thought. Yeah. And we put it on the shelf, in case we gotta think about it later. No, you should go and practice what you just learned so that it becomes mastered, yeah. and then it becomes part of who you are, and you do it naturally. Yeah. See, so that's, man, knowledge is important, and, and this knowledge of God is the same knowledge that Adam and Eve had with one another, right? That, that precipitated the birth of a child. They became completely aware of one another. Wow. And totally, totally uh, engrossed in one another. So God is saying to you, I'm revealing myself to you. Because you can't know anything about God that God has not first revealed to you about himself. You wouldn't even know his name had Moses not asked. Right. Uh -huh. Who are you? Right. Right. Who shall I say? Sit. You wouldn't know. In fact, you wouldn't even know that there was a personal God if, there, if he had not revealed himself in the Bible. If he hadn't said, I'm going to write this Bible for these folks so they can study it and read it, you wouldn't even know there's a personal God. You would know there's something. Yeah. Right. 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 But you wouldn't know it's a personal God. You see, so God is always, and I said this again, revealing himself. From the very beginning of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, he was revealing himself to you and to me so that you, we can know that there is someone who is greater than we are by scale, quantum scales. And, and, but, but more importantly, this is important, that not only does he want you to know him, he wants you to go from that level of introduction to a level of intimacy, and that intimacy has to move to the second outcome, which is trust. Right. And I'm going to take you back. You met that person for the first time. You were in elementary school or high school or whatever, or you were in college or you got your first job out of high school or whatever, and, and, and you were working and, and you met somebody on the job. You never met them before. You were 18, 19, 25 years old. And you didn't know them and you met them, but, you, but some about them, y'all just, just hit it off just like that, right? So so you was like, hey, yeah, let me give you another number. We can hang out, talk, and chill, and do whatever else. And, and now you, did you trust them at that point? No, you trusted them well enough to give them your number that they wouldn't be putting your number on bathroom walls for, for a good time called Gary. <laughs> no, you, you trusted them enough to give them your number, right? Am I, am I, am I getting too base for y'all? Like y'all ain't never seen that on the wall. Like some of you ain't wrote that on the wall. Good job. <laughs> now I hope ain't none of y'all took the number then. <laughs> So, so here's the thing, you trusted them, but what happened is, is that you were introduced to them, and therefore you began a relationship with them. 
And as that relationship matured, you trusted them more. Right. And now what happens is as trust develops, trust actually becomes the mortar that holds the relationship together. Right, right. right. See? And, and so when trust begins to erode, relationships fall apart. Yes. Yes. Exactly right, right. So God says to you, this is the second outcome. He wants you to know him with an intimacy, a love, and a passion for God. You, he wants you to have a zeal for him, but he wants it to be based on intimacy. But trust has to kick in. And listen, if you never grow to trust him, then he's not your father. You see, Fear is a dangerous thing, but it's also a blessing. Yes, it is. And we need to know the difference. Now, yes. it's, it's one of the outcomes that we'll talk about later on. But let me hasten. I want to give you those first two. So God wants you to have an intimacy with him, a closeness with him that we, that we talk about in terms of knowledge. But he also wants you to have a deep, abiding trust. So when we look at the scriptures that are found, and, and again, I apologize for those of you who don't have the material. Really, I don't because you really hear you really got it. But Proverbs chapter 3. That was, a, that was a politically correct thing to say. And then I jumped off and did the Donald Trump thing. Right? I really don't care. <laughs> and then, right, I'm sorry for y'all Trump supporters. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm a Trump supporters. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm going to hit you right between the eyes. But you know your boy ain't right. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 8 says this. Trust in the Lord with all thine. Not this. This. The heart does not dwell in the chest. Amen. The heart dwells between in the temple. Yeah. Yeah. You got to get this right. Because, see, they got you all messed up. We're talking about give him your heart. Yeah. That ain't what he means. Yeah. I went playground with that. Day. That ain't what he means. <laughs> no, he means give him your heart. Yes. Yeah. He wants your heart. Not this. In fact, when the Bible talks about emotion, it doesn't talk about your heart. It talks about bowels. The bowels. You know how you get the butterfly when you see yeah. that woman when you see that man? Yeah, yeah, right. You get that phone call, you look at it, and you're like, oh, she's calling. <laughs> That's what bowels of compassion. That's what the Bible talks about. I didn't talk about your heart out of front. The heart is in the temple. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So God, give God your heart. Love him with all your heart and soul and your might. The heart. That's important. So he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on your own understanding. Why not, Lord? Because there is a way that seems right to a man. But the ways are all the ways of death. He says, seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. He will direct thy path. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. <laughs> Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. And then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. Yes. You know, I studied martial arts, I've told you this before, for many, 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 many years. And my teacher was, we call, I called him Uncle Sonny, his name was John Rice. John Rice was a great loving man who took up martial arts because he was on his way home one night from International Harvester where he worked. Police pulled him over, dragged him out of his car, took him to a home, tried to make the ladies say he was the man that robbed her. She said it's not him. And they beat him and put him in the hospital. He came out of the hospital, said that will never happen again, started learning martial arts. <laughs> and then I, my mother introduced me to him. <laughs> she worked with our cop, his wife. Uh, and, and I had a healthy fear of Uncle Sutton. 
Healthy fear right. yeah. of Uncle Sutton. Yes, Not because I thought he would harm me, right. but because I knew he could. Right. Right. Yeah. See, because I loved Uncle Sutton. Yeah. He's gone to be with the Lord, excuse me. I love Uncle Sutton. Uncle Sonny made me, my, made me his first number one student. But he didn't make me that. He did make me, but he may, I'll tell you why I'm saying it this way. I got to a point where I trusted Uncle Sonny so much, and I, I, because I had a healthy fear of what he could do, that I wanted to be so good at what he was teaching, that I no longer had to be afraid of what he could do. Wow. So I worked harder than everybody else. And Uncle Sonny noticed that and he made me his first number one student. Huh. So whenever he left to go do something, he would bring me up and I would keep instructing the class. Wow, that's good. Because I had a healthy fear of him. I worked harder to be approved by him. God. You see, and I trusted him. Uh -huh. Right. It's the first man I've ever seen do anything like this. He, he'd be up in the train in his garage. I don't even know how old he was. I was 11 at the time. Probably by the time he, I saw him doing this, he was, I was about 15. He would jump up, grab the rafters, bring his feet up. I mean, you got to have incredible course to right. do that. Bring his feet up, barefoot. Hook his feet by his insteps and lay straight out wow. on wood rafters. Wow. A bad man. <laughs> he was a bad man. So God is a bad God. You need a healthy fear that moves you to get close to. Okay. Now, so that's the second. Trust him, trust him, trust him. In fact, one of the things I talk about, I used to do a lot of marriage workshops before I was divorced. I used to do a lot of marriage workshops, relationship workshops, and all that kind of stuff. And it was like, we can't fix his. Good Christians is like what well, God has put together that no man put us on. And you said it in your head just like that. <laughs> what God put together that no man put us on. Some of y'all already know what a son of me put it. Well, did God put that together? Let you wrestle with that one. Yeah. Wow. I got the woman our first one. I, we met I guess, 30 years ago. 30, yeah, no, actually 36 years ago. She was the first woman I ever asked Mary. She, and by his grace, she'll be the last one I ever married. Yeah, yeah. It's all right, bro. That's all right. Yes, sir. She, she, circumstances just wasn't right at the time. 1985. Yeah. Forgive me. So I, I tell them all the time, some of y'all remember my ex-wife, she was my starter wife. <laughs> Shall direct the path. We not to our own understanding. We may read. In fact, I love this. I, the imagery of the Bible is beautiful because it says, "Lean not to our own understanding." Come on, I need somebody to stand up and lean on yourself. 
See, if you get the imagery, God is not just using words, he's using imagery to communicate the truth of what he's trying to pour into your head. And if, he can, if you can become intimately aware of these things, then you will save yourself mountains of grief. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Tons of pain. Yes, sir. You won't wet your pillow so much at night with tears. You won't walk around with a scowl on your face. Say that, sir. Yeah. The third outcome, the third outcome that matters to God is this. Doing the works that glorify God increases. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 16, it says, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop cannot be hidden. No lights, no one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way. And don't miss this. He uses these images yes, to illustrate. Light is not for itself. No, no, sir. Salt is not for itself. So, in the same way, same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. So, if we understand that that our work as believers, now watch this, he intimacy, he, he, in, he increases our intimacy with. Yes, sir. And we pursue that intimacy. Yes, we, we, we want that intimacy. We want to understand the heart of God, how he loves so deeply. We want to realize that he has always been revealing himself to you. And, and every part of your life, if you start looking back over your life, you realize that he was always there, standing in the shadows. And sometimes he was standing in your face. Sometimes he was the one that was keeping you from going down that road. He was the one that told you not to get that guy your phone number. Yes, you always have to move in this piece over here and that yes, piece over there. Yes, and sometimes he puts you right on the edge and you were like, oh, Lord. <laughs> Looking over at the edge of the abyss and you were saying, I don't know what I'm going to do. Yes, sir. You didn't think he was going to get out of there, but he was right there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Teach, brother. Teach it. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's yes, sir. clear. Yes, sir. Teach, bro. That is clear. Teaching you not only how he cares about you and that you matter to him, uh -huh. but also he was showing you that you can trust me. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 And now he says, now that I, now, now that you know me, now that you trust me, go tell some people about me. That's all this is the third album. You said you know me, you love me, you have an intimacy with me, you understand some things about me, you know my heart. Yeah. And now you come to trust me because you have some history with me. Yeah. Now go talk to people about me. Yeah. 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 Wow. That's the third outcome. Open your damn mouth. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, y'all not open your mouth. Maybe you just ought to go do the work. Yeah. Yeah. My, one of our, my mentor, one of my mentors, Dr. Cocker, but praise God, he's still living and preaching in his 80s. Preaching almost every Sunday somewhere. He's been here, mm -hmm. Pastor Cockburn. And uh, he tells a story about when he was a boy living in Macomb, Mississippi. Some of y'all may know Macomb, Mississippi. Oh, yeah. I don't know. In Macomb, Mississippi, uh, he was there and his mother was ill and could not get up and move around. And, and it was them and, the, and the, the children. The father had gone north to Chicago to work so he could send money back. And uh, so they were there, and his mom was deathly ill, and there was no food in the house, and they were young, probably all under the age of 10. And he said that one night they saw off in the distance this 
line of lights, these lamps snaking their way down to their home in the bottoms. And they heard singing as they saw this line of lights snaking their way. And as they got closer, they saw women dressed in white carrying lanterns and bags. And they came in to the house singing. And they washed the dishes and they bathed the children. They fixed some meals. They cleaned the house. They took out the trash. They did everything that needed to be done. Now utter the word, just sang as they went. And as they finished up, they, they sang on the way back. Let your light so shine that men may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Sometimes the best thing you can do, in fact, always the best thing you can do, is shut up. You can't even get in trouble if you don't open your mouth. Dr. Towns was my other great mentor, by God rest his soul. His wife, Vivian, beloved, precious Vivian, passed away 1980, 1998, excuse me, 99. Uh, Good Friday weekend, I'll never forget it. Good Friday, she passed away. And, uh, God forgive me. And at the funeral, I, of course, I went to the funeral. She was like a second mother to me. And Dr. Townsend was standing out in front of the Family Life Center, the church Family Life Center, and doing something I'd never seen him do before. He was smoking. I knew he smoked, but he, I'd never seen him smoke in public. And I walked up to him. I said, T, that's what I call him, Dr. Townsend. I said, T, I don't know what to say. And he looked at me and said, Gary. And he said, Gary, he's a real gruff voice. He done with old teddy bear. But he sounded me. <laughs> and uh, he said, Garrett, just do what Job's friends did. I said, T, I don't want to do that. He said, I mean, for the first seven days. For the first seven days. Just do what they did. And he, what he meant was, y'all, if you've read the book of Job, they came and they sat yeah. wow. without speaking. Yeah. They just came and sat with him. So I left my job. I literally left my job. I didn't leave it. I actually had a contract with the government. I was going to do it anyway. I was going to leave it anyway. <laughs> but it, I left before I needed to. And we went to a conference. It was a conference out in Virginia at the school, Hampton Institute. The Hampton Institute. And we stayed there for seven days. See, sometimes you just need to be quiet. And that pre your presence is more ministry than any words you can utter. So what is the third outcome God expects? That you will minister and do the works that glorify the Father. You see, I said this yesterday. People's perception of God is based on how you represent Him. Now you wonder why folk don't want to run up in church? Look at the mirror. It ain't him. It's what you keep telling everybody about him. Or don't. You tell everybody about him. So we know that the world is full of darkness, meaning that people don't understand, right? We know that. We know their minds have been darkened, and how shall they see the light of God's glory that shines in the face of Jesus Christ if we are not the witnesses to that? See, here's the, here's the thing. What did Jesus tell his apostles? He said, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the world. Can I help you black people for a minute? Let me help you black people. Even if it was. Where's the first place God sent the gospel? After Samaria. 
Ethiopia. The Ethiopian eunuch. That's the first. Oh, let me say that. Where's the first place God sent the gospel? Ain't no amen out of that? Ethiopia. I'm, I'm excited about that. You matter to God. You want to know what black lives matter? Ask him. That's right. That's right. Don't get me started now. So now the demand for ministry. This, this, this work that we are called to do, this demand for ministry is real. And, and, and listen, beloved, as business owners, we need to understand. Because we're, we're doing the Father's business, right? Now, yeah. Jesus told his mother, which I'll be about my Father's business. You know why I'm here? What's wrong with you, woman? Huh. Didn't you know why I'm, you know why I'm here? Yeah. The angels told you. Yeah. You've done your job for 12. <laughs> But I'm here to do my father's but not Joseph. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> See, so he says, so the bottom line is you're in business as well because you've been adopted by the father. Now you're part of the family business. So our business is to do his business. That's right. Yeah. That's clear. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. That's clear. We're all marketers. Yeah. All. And if you're not willing to market, You might get released to the community. <laughs> see, see, it's a supply and demand opportunity, right? Yeah. right? See, if there's a demand, then we ought to produce an ample supply. Yeah. And if we're not producing an ample supply of ministry in our churches, then there you have it. Here's, I want you to answer this question for yourself. I'm not asking your pastor because I know he knows the answer, but I want you to ask, answer this question, not to me, just for yourself. Who is being impacted by ministry that you personally are involved in in this church? That's right. I mean, now you know you need to minister to people in the church and you need to minister to people outside the church, right? Ministry is both inside and outside. And so the reality is, you better ask yourself, who, at what part of my father's business am I handling? Wow. Who is benefited wow. by my efforts yeah. in the business of God? Man. You ever driven by McDonald's and look up at the sign? How many have been served? No. What can you put on your side? Oh, Lord. Man, man. Come on. I ain't trying to hurt nobody feeling, but if you get hurt, you better talk to man one. Call man one. Don't call me. Yeah. I ain't the man about to take across town. That's right. I'm the man who told you about the man who brought the things back. So, some of y'all talk to mama like that. She's the one who gave us that. <laughs> so, the fourth outcome that God expects of us is that your love for believers expands and grows, and that you openly demonstrate it, and so that it is evident to the world. Let me repeat this because, see, if there's one thing that I am angry about, I tell my people at my church, look, I don't, I'm not gonna get mad at you because of the way you dress. That's an appropriate way to dress. And you grown enough to know that. You said me years old. I can tell you, you a deacon, you come in here with sweat. What are you saying about the quality in your relationship with God? Right, right, right. right. What, are you, what is your message? Wow. Really? For reals? For reals. 
You see, I used to do, I used to be a consultant for the Board of Education in Louisville, and I would always do this thing with the kids. I would go out, I would say, look, you're, you are your message, and every time you walk into a place, you're communicating something. So before I ever leave the house, I put my message together, because I know. I put my message together. You know what I'm saying? And she so I would go out of the room and I would take my jacket off and I'd turn it around on the inside out. I would take one of my pants and stuff out of my sock, take my shirt, pull it out, and have it hanging down, and then I would come in and I would sit down. If I came in here the first time y'all ever met me and I was dressed like this, I said, I'm here to teach you all how to be successful. How many of y'all believe me? That's a good Come on. You be like, lock the doors. <laughs> See, so at the end of the day, if, if we don't get this, that our love for each other has to increase. That's the fourth outcome. And, but not only just increase, it has to be evident and broadcast to the world. Now, I know I dealt with this, with this some time ago when I preached here on a Sunday morning, but let me recap it. It's not part of the lesson, but it's important to this particular issue, and that is this, is that Jesus uh, tells a story of the Good Samaritan. I know the story of the Good Samaritan, right? So I don't have to go through the details of the Good Samaritan story, but let me just give you the background. So the Good Samaritan story is about who is your neighbor. Okay, so there's, there's basically four characters, the five characters, uh, in the story, right? There's the there's the Samaritan who is hated by the Jews. He's a half Jew. There's the uh, the the Pharisee, or the, you know, the priest, the Pharisee, and then there's the Levite. That's four characters. We don't know how many people jumped on the man and beat him and left him for dead. Then there's a group of people who beat him up and left him for dead. Right, so the, Pharisee, the, 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 the Samaritan is going into the town and he gets attacked and beaten, stripped of all his clothes and his wealth, left in the ditch to die, and, and here comes, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm wrong, I got it wrong. It's, it's, I'm sorry, there is a Jew, a Jewish man is beaten and stripped of his wealth and clothes and left in the ditch to die. A Pharisee, who is also a Jew, comes by a Caesar, passes on the other side. A Levi, who is also a Jew, sees him, passes on the other side. A, a Samaritan, who is a half-Jew. Now, the man in the ditch would have hated this man, who is a Samaritan. Okay? He would have hated him. He knew it. In fact, the woman at the well asked Jesus, why are you even talking to me? Jews don't talk to Samaritans. You want to talk about racism? Yeah. So the man who was hated reached down, picked this man up, put him on his own animal, took him into town, took him to what would be the equivalent of the hospital, the hotel, to the inn, told the man, look, care for him, I'm going to be going on a trip, but when I return, here's some money to take care of his needs. If there's anything that is not covered here, I'll return, when I'm going to return, I'll pay you for that. And he leaves. Now here's the thing. We don't know this because God didn't tell us, but we can make some assumptions based on what the story says. Number one, the man who was helped by the man who he would have hated never knows who helped him. <laughs> never knows who helped him. In fact, he not only never knows who helped him, he never had the opportunity to pay this man back. Huh. But he would have never probably considered to pay him back because he was a Samaritan. Yeah. The two who should have helped him went by him because they were actually bound by the law to provide help. Uh, right. The very law that the Pharisees teach and the Levites uphold, they were bound by that law to stop their wagon or their animal, pick up that person, put them on their animal, and the one who he would have hated did what the law said. Uh, so Jesus asked the question, which one of them was the name? They said, that everybody had to agree, the one who helped him. Now I want you to get this, the neighbor is the one who needs your help. But you may not have any relationship with them. Uh, 
may not have any connection to them. No affinity, no intimacy or anything, but they need to have. And there's, there are only Muslim, only Muslims down the street. Wow. That atheist who has no shoes, that's your neighbor. You have no affinity with them, you have no relationship with them, but maybe your witness and your love. Now, that's your neighbor. Jesus is sitting in the house and his mother, brother, and sisters come and they want to see him, right? And so uh, they say, Jesus, your mother, brother, and sisters outside, they want to talk to you. And Jesus says, looks at the crowd who's listening to him in the house, because his mother, brother, and sister ain't out and they ain't in the house. They come out here to take him to the doctor to see if he needs some help. Talk about it on the side. And I don't know why Mary was doing that, because Mary, you got the message. So now, so now, Jesus says, well, who are my mother, brother, and sister? He says, anyone who does the will of my father is my mother, brother, and sister. Now, I want you to see the difference. There's a family of God, and there's neighbors of the family. Yeah. And so that, so that we as believers need to make sure, that's why the scripture says, do good unto all men, especially those in the household of faith. Who lives in the household with you? Your neighbors and your family. Oh, your family. See, if we can't treat each other right with an exceptional love, Not each other, me for my mother. 